Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Marketing Against the Grain, your podcast for marketing-minded people. I am Kieran Flanagan, the CMO of Zapier, here as always with my co-host, Kip Bonner, who is the CMO of HubSpot. And we are here to tell you why Meta is secretly winning the AI wars. Let's get into it. We are here with a very, very important topic, which is the AI game is changing crazy fast. And we have a leaked memo from Google. And even though it's all about Google and OpenAI, the secret winner in this memo is Meta and Facebook and what they are doing on the AI front and how it's going to impact all marketers, all businesses out there. Kieran, I think you've read this memo maybe 100 times. You are You have dissected it. You have pieced it apart. Break down for everybody watching what this leaked memo from Google really, really means. Okay, so... We are gonna talk about this leaked memo. We should definitely reference the fact that one of us in this call has good video and audio, <laughs> one has bad video and audio, but in a weird way, the person with the bad video and audio is actually winning because Kip is in an incredible place. I won't divulge your location in case people come and- I'm, uh, I'm an undisclosed location on the road, the but it is awesome. I do not have my normal gear with us, but this is so important. We that still we have had, AI. We, ha we had to do the pod, <laughs> you know? Okay, so we, we, you and I went back on WhatsApp. Uh, you're on holiday and we decided that there was so much good stuff in here, so you were gonna jump on a podcast. So listeners, this is how committed we are. Okay, so what is up with this? A leaked memo. So apparently it is a leaked memo from Google talking about the fact that Google has no moat to AI. Now, if Google has no moat to AI, no one has any moat no to one AI. Has a moat. Yeah. So if Google has no uh, moat, yeah, exactly, Kip, then no software company has a moat. But why do they feel they have no moat? Okay. There are a couple of cool things I want to call out in this memo, get you to react to, and then go into what Google thinks it should do. I think the first thing that was kind of mind blowing to me, this is one of the things that we were going back and forth on is just when you think about web two, like we were talking about this off the camera, <laughs> there was a, just a yeah. couple of aggregators who won web two, right? There's the Google, Amazon, Meta, some of these large players. The big fan companies, they had their proprietary algorithm, their proprietary data, and they won, and they won the market, right? They won the market. So we had yeah. monopolies. Now, in my mind, the monopolies were going to be the large language model companies like the open AIs, the companies who had the best large language model. What we discovered through this memo or what it did a good job of setting the scene is large language models are being commoditized. Like they are being open sourced ever since Meta released its model Llama got released at the start of March to the public. We are just seeing this explosion of large language models. And these large language models are being created really cheaply. There is one called, here we go, prepare listeners. <laughs> oh, let's go. Here and mispronounce it. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. You know this much. So Vic Inu, V-I-C-U-N-A, yes. Vic Inu, they have an open source chatbot. It is like just below bar in ChatGPT in terms of accuracy. So just below those two, right? Google, OpenAI, billion, billion dollars companies. This chatbot was trained for $300. <laughs> uh, one iteration of that training was like $300. That's crazy. And this is one of the things Google called out, which is like, ever since we have open source large language models and given them to the public, one of the things they said was the barrier to entry for training and experimentation has dropped from the total output of a major research organization to one person and free <laughs> evening, because hey, like we have a free evening. What, what, what are we gonna do? Like Bill, watch Love is Blind, uh, maybe, or build a large language <laughs> model, right? So to one person, a free evening and a beefy laptop. And that is what they think has happened, right? Like this yeah, has been completely open sourced and anyone has the power to create a large language model. So that's number one. I wanna just quickly get your reaction to that. I think it's kind of mind blowing. Well, it's completely mind blowing. And I, I think if you're watching, what you need to understand is this all started with the Transformer white paper, right? So Google and DeepMind have been the key researchers on right. AI for over a decade, right? For a, for a long time. And they released a white paper, I believe it's called Attention Matters, uh, that is all about the Transformer technology, which is the underpinning technology of large language models. And that was essentially the basis of what OpenAI was able to build on. Without that Transformer white paper being published to the public, OpenAI wouldn't exist. And right. so then OpenAI goes and iterates and does all of its things. And in the meantime, Google and Meta are doing their same thing. And now Facebook essentially gets leaked their large language model perspective, Llama. And the more that this stuff comes out and open to the public, once it's out to the public, 
the open source community, open source is really just means building in public. Instead of right. one company controlling, locking it all down, the whole community has access to it. So it's the epitome, if you're a marketer, of thinking about a community strategy or community-led growth, it is that, but for the development of new technology. And that is what's happening in AI right now, is that any implication or any innovation is becoming open source. We, we've done, we did a show on AutoGPT, Baby AGI. That is all open source on GitHub right now. Right, right. Like one of the the trademarks of Web 2.0 was a closed model. People really kind of were hard on Meta and a lot of companies for locking down all of their data, their R and D, all those things is proprietary. Open source, it looks like, is going to win the next generation of the internet. That's one of the key takeaways. That if you're out there thinking about how this technology is going to evolve, you have to understand that open source has this like kind of unfair advantage right now. It basically de-aggregates the aggregators. Like in yes. Web 2, we aggregate, and we talked about this before, Web 1, everything was de-aggregated. Web 2, everything gets aggregated up. Web 3, which is, you know, more AI than crypto, everything gets de-aggregated again. Because now, actually, you have so many people can build their own. If we decide that, or if we actually see search move much more into kind of a chatbot type experience, yeah. then you, you can compete with a multi-trillion dollar company with a very small team and build your own unique experience on a very specific data set. The other thing that this memo called out was, and Google called this out in relation to the Vic Nuno chatbot, in that they are doing things with, they, their exact line was, that open source project are doing things with $100 and 13 billion parameters in terms of like the data set they can train from that Google are struggling to do with $10 million and $550 billion parameters. So let me just say it again. They are doing things with $100 because it takes $100 to train the model mm -hmm. once with 13 billion parameters. And Google is struggling to do the same thing with $10 million and $550 billion. And what they're finding is small data sets. This models is the big trained on away. small, yeah. Models trained on very specific data sets are much better than models trained on all of the data. Much easier to train, much easier to do much fast iteration on. And that's a big learning, I think, for Google, a big learning for how this is going to mm -hmm. continue to expand in that you're going to start to see much more, I think, specific AI experience trained on specific data sets and just this conglomerate aggregator that we had seen in Web2. Well, yeah, so I think what you're really telling everybody watching is that Web 2 was all about, you know, the bigger the better. You know, like the more data, the more people you could connect, the, the more aggregation you could do, the more value you could provide. And what we're saying in Web 3 is the next successful company might be built off of a training budget of 100, 1,000, $10,000, not tens of millions of dollars, right, for right. their data and, and everything. And that is very, very different than the world that we've all been accustomed to over the last 10 to 15 years, right? Right. And we are moving to an era of depth instead of breadth. The last generation of the internet was like, how wide could you go? How much breadth of coverage could you have? And now it's, you can build really compelling products just by going deep in a very, very focused area. And the reason you can do that is because web browsers have gotten a lot better, mobile phones have gotten a lot better, internet connectivity has gotten a lot faster. Like, you know, WebGPT exists where you can run an AI agent in your Chrome web browser because Chrome has gotten so good, right? right? So part of the irony of this is that companies like Google and Apple and Meta and all these companies that have made these like foundational technologies, web browsers, mobile phones, et cetera, have made them so good, you can now run these models on them. You can run the large language models on a Pixel phone. And I know. Well, there, was a, there was a really exactly. great qu quote, which is like, if you do believe the, you know, AI is this generation's nuclear weapons in terms of the potential to be an accelerant for the world and be a mm -hmm. <laughs> cataclysmic yeah. event for the world, but you can never put a nuclear weapon on your phone, right? Like it just like anyone can walk around with these large language models and train them on their phone. It's kind of bananas when you think you can actually have an entire AI large language model running off your phone. Like that is crazy. Well, one of the one of the things I believe is that the future and the innovation is often a function of unintended consequences, right? Like we have this plan, we have these things we think are gonna happen. And there's a bunch of things that happen that we'd never expected. And that's actually what kind of catalyzes change and, and forces things to be different. And that's what's happened. I think I'm putting myself in the shoes of Google, Amazon, Apple, all these large companies. 
I think they would have thought, oh my gosh, you know, these large language models, this AI technology is going to be so expensive to run that you're never going to be able to run it on a mobile device, on a web yeah. browser, yeah. on a desktop, all of these things. And so we're safe to innovate. And the reality is what we're learning is that models that are smaller are better. And when you have a smaller model, oh, that actually works really well on your phone. That really works well on your web browser, or your desktop, or what have you. And that completely changes the whole paradigm here. And it's going to make innovation and company formation and disruption with AI much, much more democratized. And so if you're right. watching this and you are thinking about what the heck does this all mean to my business, what it means is that if you've got some unique data in a, in a very specific market, you have the ability to build a model, a large language model, pretty cheaply that can transform how you and your customers and your whole market interacts with that data and information, right? I think the equivalent of the, ag the aggregator that probably will exist, and there will be a lot of them trying to compete for this, which is just the plug and play model where you or I can go to some sort of site. And I've seen some startups starting to build this, which is, and we can just feed in our data. Let's say we put in yeah. an RSS feed or, of our podcast, and we can just build a large language model by just add in that RSS feed and we get spit back at an LLM model that we can start to use into different apps and stuff. So like a version of- That's a great idea. A version of opening eyes following the Google mantra, like they, they build on top of Google and then they close their model off. And I think what will actually end up happening is people will just want to plug in their data and be able to build front end apps themselves on that data and do it really easily, like with drag and drop and all these kind of things. And I think there's going to be companies, I've seen some companies talk to a founder actually building in the space. And I think that plug and play is going to be really interesting. The other lesson for our listeners that I would love to kind of point out here, and I need to keep changing our tone. I don't know if you read our comments because I read our comments in, in YouTube. <laughs> I, know, I read all of our the, comments. Oh, I love reading our comments. Like troll the Please head out keep, of us in the comments. Keep, if you want to troll, troll, troll. Subscribe on YouTube. Uh, we want all of that. Let's go. I think someone said that we are we are AI, like we are robot. Like he's like, I just can't put my finger on it. Like I think you guys are like AI yourselves. And I think, so I'm trying to change up my tone to show that there's a real person here at the end of the screen. But the, the other thing that is like a real just, great Just so everybody here, knows, everybody watching, this is this is the 500th time in Kieran's life he's been accused of being yeah, robotic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> new information. My, my first feedback that I ever got as a manager is, Kieran is too robotic. He comes in and he says, is the chart up or down? And doesn't give a shit about me. What's wrong with that? Uh, <laughs> I know, yeah. I, think, I was like, that's excellent management. <laughs> yeah, uh, straight to the point. Here's a great thing that I think you can take away for your listener. Actually, just on, it's actually related to product-led growth in Freemium because Freemium oh, cool. is a version of open source. And Google had this like really cool thing where they were like, who would pay for Google product with usage restrictions if there is a free high quality alternative without them. Now, why is this really important for PLG companies? And if you're a founder listening to this, why product like growth in a B2B tech company is so important? Because if you can actually build a freemium tool and start to monetize that tool and then move up market, what you can do is you can kill the lower end of the market by having better unit economics than any of the smaller companies trying to build up from beneath because you've mm -hmm. expanded up market, your LTV is much better, you have net dollar positive churn, and you can start to drag things into free and just make it uncompetitive to compete with you. And Google's line from that reminded me of like why PLG is such a great go-to-market motion because they're like, hey, like we, we're trying to charge you money for this. And someone's just made a free version of it because their unit economics or what they're using it for is much better than what we're going to use it for. And it just kills your ability to compete. Like pricing and packaging is the best tool that most companies had. And I thought that was like a real interesting moment from Google. The other thing they said, Kip, is I think the coming back to that plug and play, like who who owns the ecosystem? That's yeah. the thing that Google called out is like the value of owning the ecosystem cannot be overstated. They did it with Chrome and Android. Like what is that platform for AI? I've been trying to rack my brain. Like There's what is the ecosystem right for now. AI? There's not one, but I wonder what it's going to be. Like, is it I, just I, the I agree. meta large, is everyone just building on, is meta? Like this is the, if this is the, is meta winning the AI wars, right? This is like the yeah. whole, our whole kind of premise here because everyone is building on Llama and what Google called out is like, they've just inherited millions of workers for free because they're just getting all of this data that they can use yeah, within their exactly. own products. Like, well, that's the power of open source, that's right? That's the power of open source. And what, of open we're, source. what we're talking about today, show, we can talk about AI, we can talk about marketing, building your business. What we're really talking about is, you know, Darmesh, who's co-founder of HubSpot, friend of you and I, Karen, you know, one of the first quotes I think he ever shared with you and I is like, your success is directly dependent on how many people want you to succeed. Yeah. 
right? The more people out in the world that want you to succeed will enable you to be, be more successful. And that's essentially the theory of whether you're trying to build a community, whether it be an open source web development community or a community around your business, that's, that's the whole kind of first principle around it. The more people who are invested in your success, the more successful you will be. And that's what's going to win. And so if you're somebody like Meta with the Llama model, you're like, oh my gosh, like this has been way better than I have expected in terms of just adoption of this technology. Yes, we have to, we, we take some trade-offs in making this technology available to people, but you also get a lot of upside in making this technology available to people. If you are watching this show, the big takeaway here is that AI is moving to open source very quickly, right? And a lot of this technology is going to be available to everyone. However, some of these, some of the data, some of the models are going to be proprietary and they're going to coalesce around some type of platform. And I think, Kieran, what you and I are saying is we just don't know what that platform is yet. No, because right? what we we're, don't. What, yeah, what open source does is it reduces the value of something to near nothing. So large language models were like, oh shit, like we should invest in large language model companies. They're going to be the Google of the future and have a ton of power, and make a ton of money. Completely not no, true they, anymore. Now they're not, right? Because open source has commoditized that and decreased the value of those large language models. So it makes it really hard for anyone to build a real great business of those around those because anyone can copy it and build a version of that. And so then you're like, okay, well, large language models is foundational, but it's going to be open sourced and anyone's going to have, uh, it's going to be really easy to access these things. So we we moved up from hardware and database, right? Like obviously they're below the large language models. They make a ton of money, but then above large language models on terms of like the applications and things like that, I wonder where the large conglomerate company is going to come from. OpenAI is that today, but I thought it was really interesting in this memo, like even when they, they ended the memo, memo with, and in the end, they said OpenAI doesn't matter. They are making the same mistakes we are in their posture relative to open source, right? All of the mistakes that Google are making, they think OpenAI are making the same mistakes and just will not be a footnote in terms of who they have to win against. They don't think it's OpenAI. They think it's like, how do we be part of the open source community? That is a shift and a half for Google to make, like this closed source yeah. company. Well, I mean, it's also a leaked memo. It's not Google's position, right? It's somebody right. who's working with Google who has this point of view. And so you could take that with a grain of salt. But they're not wrong in that open source has a lot of power and is this kind of ubiquitous competitor to all these large technology players. And what all of us watching this should, should take away is, Wow, that this the more open source wins, the more power and control we have for our own businesses, right? Right. And that's I think ultimately a good thing. It's a good thing if you have unique data, if you build expertise in this technology, you can really like move ahead and use that in a really interesting way. If you are waiting for one company to kind of own this market, this is our signal that that's not going to happen, right? There're going to be a lot of diverse players in this market. Some big ones, some small ones. And you're going to be running lots of different AI models to execute the work you want to do within your business. Like, I think that we know for certain. We don't know how many you're going to make yourself versus, you know, pay for from other people or what have you. But it's not going to be one large language model rules all of the business that you want to get done. No. Right? I think it's also going to be a great case study of distribution it being first yes. wins because open AI were first. They built up a user base of 100 plus million. Their stuff gets commoditized really fast. What's really strange to me is the Bing chat GPT kind of relationship where Bing are putting all of the same features into a Bing chat. Like they're putting plugins and mm -hmm. putting all of the features that chat GPT just put live. And so that's a weird relationship there. Like Microsoft heavily invested in ChatGPT. Maybe they're just like, hey, we win in both spots. <laughs> you use ChatGPT, you use yeah. us, we win in both spots. It's not a it's not a bad play. And if you look at Google, I, like we can just end on the TLDR from Google. I think they actually summarized it really good in terms of how software companies will have to think about the AI space. They're like, hey, we need to just enable integrations. Like we need to be a center of gravity. We need to be plugged yes. in through all of these different tools and systems. People won't play for unrestricted models when free is good enough. Again, this is the PLG play. PLG is a very disruptive go-to-market because you can actually de-commoditize or you can commoditize what your competitors are actually giving away and paying for or are actually charging for. And the best models, this is the big one I thought was my big takeaway is like the best models are small, can be iterated on quickly, less than 20 billion parameters. And the bigger models are going for trillion, you know, trillions of parameters. And this is like moving from 
the broad based large language model to these very specific custom large language models. So there's probably companies sitting on a treasure trove of data, like in health, in fintech, and all of these kind of different sectors sitting on like a treasure trove of data, like Bloomberg just released their own kind of chatbot trained on their data. That is where probably some of the, you know, unknown winners or the kind of surprising winners are going to come from within the AI era. Well, yes. And Kieran, I think this is a reminder for everybody who watches the show to listen to the breadcrumbs that people leave behind. Because what did we talk about a couple months ago on the show is that Sam Altman, who, who runs OpenAI, was basically saying, hey, the next model, GPT-5, the next model that we roll out, is likely going to have less parameters, not more. Right. Right? Exactly. And so he fundamentally, like Sam basically set the breadcrumbs for this to happen. He was like, he saw that actually smaller parameter models were going to be more valuable, right? And with that, we all have to infer that when somebody's making a statement like that, there is much more power behind it. It's like a fundamental change in their strategy, right? And that's going to set the course for how this market works. And what we are saying is that if you are a business out there today and you are executing and thinking about using AI, you're going to use models with less parameters. You're going to use models from different companies. You're probably going to build some of your own models with your own data because the technology is going to become way more accessible. And that is all very transformative to how we're actually going to be able to build a business and grow in the future, right? Yes. Open source. I, I guess if you're a company, every founder today, we you covered it actually in the last, one of the last episodes is like, grown up through the innovator's dilemma and has is trying to figure out how to disrupt themselves and what is our moat. Look, if Google are struggling to figure out what their moat is, don't be too hard on yourself because <laughs> it means there is like everyone is trying to figure out their moat right now. And the only one who seems to have like true leverage here is Meta because they are the the LLM choice of the open source community. Like everything is getting built upon their leak model. So I think the TLDR is, look, it's really hard to establish your moat right now. Everything is up for grabs. So this is, this is my point. Do moats exist anymore? This was actually my point. Okay. You know, we grew up the last 20 years of business thinking that you had to have some competitive advantage and differentiation to build a successful business. Is technology getting so good that the competitive advantages are just largely going away? And that it's coming down to just execution of the idea versus like actual business strategy advantages because the more I look at the technology market, the less competitive differentiation and advantages that exist. Yeah. I think your moat is, I think hardware companies and data warehouse companies still have <laughs> moats. <laughs> well, I, I think we believe that communities are still moats, right? The, again, whether it be open source, whether it be community built around the practice yeah. of how your business works, like the more people that want you to be successful, the more successful you're going to be, right? I like agree. I do think yeah. communities are a big moat still. Yeah, community and brand is a moat. And then we're going to find out, I think through the open AI next 12 to 18 months is being first the moat. Yes, we're going to see how important early, er, early first mover advantage work actually is going forward. And what we're telling you, if you're watching today's show is, this is all benefits you, right? Like you're the winner of all of this stuff that's happening because you're getting better technology cheaper to build the business you're trying to run through just kind of the competition and force. This is actually kind of capitalism at its best. Makes me, I'm an optimist, obviously, so it makes me happy to see all of this. And what you should be doing is observing what's going on, learning and applying the best parts of it to your business. Yeah. Okay, I have a great ending actually for this. It's um, yeah from one of Wait my on favorite me. movies, Tegela, what is it? Tequila Nights, Tequila, the racing car with Talladega Nights. Talladega Nights. Yeah. Yeah. I thought <laughs> you said Tequila Nights for a second. That's a whole different story. And so if you are not first, you're last. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> TLDR, if you're yeah, not there, first, no, you're the, last. For companies adopting AI, there's certainly a first mover advantage. We know that. If you're not first, you're last. This was our sneak peek at how Meta is winning the AI wars and Google and OpenAI's role and how that's evolving in the AI wars. We will see you very soon on Marketing Instagram. Bring me something nice back, Kip. <laughs> Always. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history. Calls, support tickets, emails, and here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot, grow better. 